Hello and Namaste. My name is Brandon and welcome to the next video in my series on time series. In this video, we will learn about certain data considerations and assumptions you should keep in mind when formulating and solving time series problems. And as always, like, comment, and subscribe. So let's get started. First on our list is domain knowledge. So domain knowledge and context. Domain knowledge is crucial for implementing time series. What I mean by domain knowledge is having some fundamental understanding or some context about the field in which you are formulating a time series problem. So maybe you work in healthcare, finance, small business, government policy, or whatever it might be. So having some basic fundamental level of knowledge about that domain is crucial. You should know what data to collect, how to collect it, how to visualize it, how to interpret it, and how to communicate and implement any findings. In a similar vein, are there any lagged indicators that can give you a jump on the forecast? So when you do time series forecasting, if you have domain knowledge about the field, you might know about any indicators that happen before what you're forecasting, but you will likely only get that by knowing a bit about the field in which the time series problem is being constructed. Prior research and analysis. Knowing any prior research or similar forecasting projects, methods, and outcomes can make your project stronger and provide gravitas to it or some weight to it. So if you look at your research project or your analysis in the context of similar research projects or other similar analyses that have been done, you can pull off that pre-existing knowledge and use it to inform your own work. So maybe some conclusions were raised, maybe some novel methods were implemented, and you are joining that conversation, whether it's a research project in academia or like a business analysis project in your job. So what other research, what other analysis has been done that's similar to the project you are working on? Also, knowing that prior research and analysis keeps you from reinventing the wheel if you can. A question to ask is, is there a standard or some prior workflow that you can use in your own work? If that's the case, there is no need to reinvent the wheel for your project. Next, data sources. Where did the data come from? Has it been verified or audited? Is it just some random data you found on the web? Is it data from a government service, which is bound by law to be accurate? Is it enterprise level data that's in a data warehouse in your business or some business client? So knowing or at least understanding sort of the chain of custody of the data from collection to your project is important because you want to know what data you are actually using in your project to guard against any issues or problems or false conclusions that may arise from problematic data. Another thing to know is how you get the data. So will the time series have to be pulled using a script or a macro? So for example, you might have to go through an SQL command or some other process to get data from a data warehouse in a business. For government data, you might have to input a bunch of fields or checkboxes or something else to filter exactly what you need. And then on the back end, it will do all the magic. And then you just download the file after you do that. But leading into a project, you will want to understand and think about where the data is going to come from in the first place, and will you have to ask another person to do that, or will you have to do it yourself? Will it require some specialized skill set, or maybe going back to where the data came from, will you have to go out and collect it yourself firsthand? Is the data source living or static? So if the data is live, will your analysis update in real time using automation? Or will you have to go back and update your analysis periodically because the underlying data has changed, it's living? Or is the data static for a certain period of time and your analysis will always be based on that static period of data? Will the data always be available to reanalyze and or measure forecast performance? This seems like a common sense assumption you can make, but trust me, from firsthand experience, never assume that the data you're pulling will always be where you pulled it from or the methods you used to pull that data will always be valid. So always ask yourself if that data will always be available and the source and methods you use to get it will always be valid. Sometimes it will, but other times it may not be. Next, we have frequency and specificity. So time frequency. What is the appropriate level of time detail? Too frequent of time detail can capture a lot of noise and generate extraneous data points. 
This can increase complexity and decrease speed in your analysis. Aggregating time into larger units can reduce noise but sacrifice resolution. For example, if you're analyzing traffic flow over time, is knowing that traffic flow in one minute spans necessary? What about every 30 minutes or one hour? Likewise, if you are tracking CO2 emissions, is it necessary to know the CO2 emissions for every day or is every week or maybe every month or even every year sufficient? So understanding time frequency and aggregation level is very important. Next, specificity. What is the scope of the time series in terms of, for example, time period, population, geography, asset class, or some other characteristic? So how granular do you need to get when looking at your time series data? Or can you look at a higher level? For example, let's say you are forecasting revenue for a chain of stores across a given country. Now, do you need to know the time series data for each individual store? Or do you need the time series data for each individual, say, county or city in aggregate, so a wider level of specificity? Or can you just have the time series data for the entire state that you're working in? So the level of specificity is really something you need to determine ahead of time when you're doing your time series forecast. Likewise, if you are tracking something or forecasting something like CO2 emissions, do you need to know the CO2 emissions of each individual company? Or can you track CO2 emissions at the level of say business sector? That's specificity. Overspecifying can lead to low or zero counts and underspecifying can erase distinctions. So it's always a balance. And in the count example, if you are forecasting the frequency of something, but that event is rare over time, you could have zero counts if you're measuring in too small a time window. So you might need to widen the time window so you actually have more counts. But on the flip side, underspecifying and having too wide of a time window or too large of a geography or too large of a population or something like that can erase distinctions. So it's always a balance between overspecifying and underspecifying. Next, missing data and data quality. Garbage in, garbage out. So controlling for, or at least being aware of, any limitations with respect to data quality, such as missing values, inconsistent measurements, problematic data sources, cross-referencing, biases, etc., are important to know. So once the problem is formulated and you go to get the data to answer the questions in that problem, it seems obvious, but always keep in mind the quality of the data you're using to solve your problem. Now, some time series techniques can handle missing observations while others cannot. So moving averages, smoothing, ARIMA, etc., cannot handle missing observations. Now, linear regression, logistic regression, neural networks can. So sometimes having missing values is okay, depending on the technique that you are using. Other times, it's not okay. Now, techniques that cannot tolerate missing values must undergo aggregation, imputation, or, quote, forecasting for the missing value itself through a secondary technique. Another way to approach this issue is by using ensemble methods. So you can use one method where missing values can be used and then impute values into one where it cannot be used and then compare the two or average them together. So always understand data quality. And then if you have missing values, what techniques you can and cannot employ using that data. Next, we have derivative data. So will the original data need to be transformed or modified from its original form? One common example is changing country data in aggregate to per capita data, which does a couple of things. It keeps our data from being misleading because of course the size of the country will impact the aggregate data. It also allows this measure to be compared across countries because it sort of standardizes that measure. So we take whatever aggregate measure we're looking at and then we divide that by the number of people in the country, and then we have per capita. The data may or may not come that way, but we may have to transform it into that if we're looking at that measure. Creating financial ratios are another example of derivative data. So you may have two measures where you divide one by the other to get some sort of ratio. Transforming units, so miles to kilometers, Celsius to Fahrenheit, etc. That's a simple data transformation, but depending on your problem, you may need to do something like that. Will the data need to be aggregated across time? So turning days into weeks, weeks into months, months into years, etc. That's a very common thing to do where we go ahead and create larger periods of time from smaller periods of time. 
Another example is averaging measures across geographic regions or having a weighted average across geographic regions. For example, if we're in a region that has north, south, east, and west, we wouldn't necessarily just average those four things together. We want to take into account the proportional contribution of each region to that average. So you could take a pure time series that is just time and then the measure in the second column and then add additional columns for each measure. So they could be indicator variables, which are ones and zeros for some sort of event. It could be in a certain geographical region, some sort of other classification or other categories for each measure. So you'll take a quote pure time series and then add additional variables for each measure. I did this when I was looking at my energy usage for my home. So I had the pure time series, which was the day and then the kilowatt hours I used, but then I added other variables to the right of that. So I added what day of the week it was. I added if I was doing laundry that day, I added the outside temperature for that day, the outside humidity for that day, whether or not it rained that day, whether or not I was home that day. But I started with just two columns day and kilowatt hours used, but then I added the other variables to try to build a model of that data. Time spacing. Most time series techniques assume equally spaced measurements through the passage of time. Another thing to look at is what if the time series contains random or sporadic events that occur at non-regular intervals? Now some methods can handle such data, others cannot. So a method such as regression or recurrent neural network that can accommodate indicator variables are very flexible in this regard. And as we've discussed, imputation or aggregation may need to be implemented. Outliers. Unexpected or completely random events can create extreme values at certain points in time. So natural disasters, pandemics, flash crashes in stock markets, misinformation that goes out in the news, etc. There could also be a data entry error, data corruption issue, and so on. Techniques that require recent information can be thrown off severely due to outlier values, such as moving averages and so on. If you get an extreme value, for example, in a three-day moving average, that can create havoc because that three-day average will be greatly affected by that extreme value. If your moving average is 5, 10, or even longer, it may not have that much of an effect. So you have to keep in mind the effect of outliers or extreme events on the technique you are using. The decision as to whether to remove or modify outliers requires domain knowledge and careful consideration. An outlier does not mean it's wrong. An outlier does not mean it's a data entry error. An outlier can be valid. So the decision to keep, modify, or remove outliers is something you need to think carefully about. And if you do something like that, always document it. And similar to the missing value issue, Oftentimes, two or more techniques can be used, one with and one without the outliers, and then you can compare the two or average them together. Time scope. How far into the past should you look when forecasting? How far is it necessary to look to get to your goal? Some prediction methods are more immediate, whereas modeling methods tend to span longer periods of time. Did a fundamental change occur at some point in time that marks a before and after era resulting in an overall shift in level? Obviously events like pandemics, wars, terrorist attacks, stock market crashes, or other events can fundamentally create a before and after event that has to be taken into account. Was a definitional change in scale, measurement, or unit done that requires some sort of conversion? It is not uncommon that a business or a government will change the way they measure something at some point in time. Therefore, the data that comes after that change has to be modified or converted into the original scale or vice versa so that we're working in the same scale or measurement when doing the time series. It goes without saying that if you're measuring a time series on one scale or measurement or unit up to a certain point, then something changes, your data after that point is going to be probably fundamentally different than what came before that change. Are current observations dependent on prior observations? And if so, what counts as included in that dependency? So in some cases, each individual time series observation isn't independent. It is dependent on something that happened before it. And therefore the time scope of an individual observation is not singular. It is multiple events in time. 
Okay, that wraps up this video on data considerations and assumptions that you should think about when formulating and solving time series problems. Like the previous video, these are things that sometimes people forget to think about. They get a time series and just jump right into whatever tool they're using and perform their analysis without thinking about any of the context, any of the data quality issues, any of the other things that might come up when it comes to thinking about the robustness and the veracity of the time series data they are using. I hope you found these questions helpful and give you food for thought as you continue your time series journey. Thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Take care and bye-bye.